Good evening to our audience in the UK and good afternoon and morning to our audience in the US and beyond. On behalf of Partside SDA Fellowship located in Reading, England, I would like to welcome you to today's program titled No Fear of Falling. And our special guest today is Linda Anderson. As we prepare for our guest speaker, I would kindly ask that everyone mute their mic to not disturb the, disrupt the speaker. Additionally, we would like to encourage you to engage in this presentation by placing any questions or comments you may have in the Zoom chat box so that we can have a lively discussion following the presentation. Once again, thank you for tuning in today. Um, I, at this time, I will um, introduce Linda. Uh, I'm going to read her bio. Um, Linda R. Anderson has a career in communication which spans over 30 years. She's a graduate of Oakwood College, now University in Huntsville, Alabama, where she currently serves as Dean of Women. Linda holds degrees in communications and business administration. Born and raised in Connecticut, Linda's work has taken her to various um, cities across the southern region of the United States and along the east and west coasts, including in Seattle, Washington, where she spent 11 years prior to relocating. While residing in the Pacific Northwest, Linda served as legal administrator for the legal and licensing departments of Experience Hendricks, the, um, Experience Hendricks, the family company of the iconic rock guitarist Jimi Hendrix. Additionally, she served as executive assistant to the president of the company, performing the duties of liaisons between the president, CEO, and the public. She previously held the position of media representative for the Trinity Hendrix record label, a subsidiary division of Experience Hendrix. In her previous, um, in her previous um, public relations capacity, she undertook the responsibility of maintaining artist relations with gospel retailers, as well as radio stations and other mediums. Linda traveled ex extensively with signed artists, handling of tour schedules, publicity and public relations. As legal administrator, Linda was involved in the mechanical licensing of music and assisted in in-house counsel in the protection of intellectual properties. Linda continues to serve as a publicist for Experience Hendrix. Linda's background includes 12 years in radio as an on-air personality, hosting various radio programs, also serving as news director and anchor slash reporter for several years. Her communications involvements include public speaking engagements, workshops and seminars in the areas of career advancement, crisis management, conflict resolution, interpersonal communications, and grief support. She is a member of the Oakwood University's Leadership Academy, which trains department directors for next level performance. She holds a certificate in conflict resolution and mediation from La Sierra University. Linda is a life coach and volunteers her services to the Boys and Girls Club of America, offering public speaking and writing workshops. While Linda's professional career has brought her considerable exposure, ministry is her true passion. Yet through praise ministries, Linda's, Linda has been privileged to share the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ at numerous women's conferences, workshops, and other special events at churches across the country and in Canada. Her ministry has enabled her to cross ethnic and social barriers, bridging gaps and connecting with people of all ages, cultures, and backgrounds. God's love is amazingly all encompassing. It, if it can connect us to heaven, then certainly it should be able to connect us as brothers and sisters on earth. In addition to her work with Oakwood University, which keeps her busy as surrogate mum to 200 freshman women, her civic involvements and public speaking, Linda enjoys family. Her pride and joy is her lovely daughter, Brooke, who recently married and lives in North Carolina with her delightful husband. 
Linda is an active member of her church and belongs to several religious organizations. She has two Christian music recordings and is a published writer whose work has been seen in national gospel and religious publications. She is also author of the published devotional books entitled Fragments and Fragments 2. Linda, we want to welcome you back to Parkside because um, uh, not too long ago you did a wonderful presentation on being a single parent and so we, we're just so glad to have you back here again today. It's my pleasure. I'm so honored. I, in fact, I'm shocked. Uh, because with some of the things that I shared, I thought they might say, well, we might need to find another speaker this time. <laughs> <laughs> no, never. We would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I appreciate this opportunity to share. And I think that life is the best uh, school. And I've learned a lot. And if I can use what I've learned to help somebody else make it through something, then it's worthwhile. So thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Plus, I love London. So I get to pretend that I'm there right now, although I'm in the residence <laughs> hall and I hear girls running upstairs above my head right now. <laughs> so Linda, your title is No Fear of, um, falling. of Falling. Tell yeah. us about that because okay. I know most of us hate to fall, right? We Right. We do everything in life to avoid falling, right? Yes, and, and, yeah. and most of us have a fear of height. So right. can I pray with you and then, then I'll start oh, and then yes, uh, I'll leave the door open to answer some questions at the okay. end if anybody wants to ask me about my, uh, my ma maniac lifestyle. Okay. Let's pray. <laughs> kind Father, it is in the name of Jesus that we come to you right now and ask that you would fill us with your spirit. God, I thank you so much for um, choosing us, those that are here, in this moment, um, at this time, uh, for whatever you have in store for us. We thank you for this invitation uh, to be in your presence. And now, God, we ask that you would um, allow me to be able to share something that will bless and uplift and encourage others. And as always, God, I ask that you would silence me, that you might be heard, and hide me, that you might be seen. And may everything that I say bring you glory and encourage your children. In Jesus' name, amen. So I have this, uh, this brief message entitled, um, No Fear of Falling. And um, I think you'll find it interesting that um, the way that God has led me throughout my life has had to be through trial and error. I've had to have some very simple experiences. I always say that God, realizing that I'm not the, the shiniest penny in the drawer, he's had to teach me in some very unconventional ways and some very simple ways. So in order for me to grow, I've had to go through some simple things um, that God used to enlighten me. And I see all of my girls here and I, I can't move forward without at least acknowledging them. My, my uh, village, I see my girls in the house. So I wanna say hi to all of you. And I, I can't mention everybody's name, but I do see Gina and Lisa and Vicki and I see Vinette and I see um, Deb. So I have to acknowledge you uh, because you are part of my network and you have been with me all along the way. So you'll know that everything that I'm referencing in this message to be true. So because I, um, I, for a long time, had a fear of falling, and I want to share this text with you. Here's the scripture. It's Micah chapter 7 and verse 8, and here's what it says. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. That's Micah 7, 8. So I have, from childhood, had a fear of heights. I was afraid of being up high. I remember climbing a tree once when I was a kid and then I was too afraid to get down. Somebody had to come get me down from the tree that I probably had no business climbing. But I've, I've had a fear of heights. I had a fear of the dark. And so God recognizing that those fears were probably gonna hold me back from some things that he had in store for me. He put within me the desire to overcome those fears. So I began to love the sky and, and now I'm someone who absolutely loves the sky. I love to fly, I love traveling. Uh, back in the olden days when we could actually get on planes and go places, I long for those days again. But I love to fly and I actually love flying outside of a vehicle, let me explain. Uh, in order to overcome my fear of heights, I decided to go parasailing, I've been skydiving and I've been paragliding. And I need, I've even been on some tall rides like at California Adventure in California. And I've been on the Tower of Terror. And you're probably saying, well, what on earth 
could you gain of a spiritual nature from getting on rides? Let me share with you. I remember um, once going to California Adventure with my best friend, Lisa. We took the kids to Disneyland and we took them to California Adventure and there was this ride called California Screaming. And so we decided we were gonna get on this ride. Now, Lisa has a fear of heights as well, but she said, I'm gonna get on this ride. And so when we get on the ride, the minute we got on, we had immediate buyer's remorse. And it was a ride that took off so fast that it, it was, um, they told us that it was gonna go from zero to a hundred in a matter of seconds. And it went so fast that the tracks got hot and there were areas where water would spray up on the tracks to cool them down. And we got on this ride together. And so what did I learn from this? Well, first of all, I learned that Lisa can pray because she was behind me in the seat and the whole ride, I heard her screaming and praying and I heard her promising God that if he got her off that ride, Lord, I'll never get on, which is what we tend to do when we're in a tight spot. So she was screaming and laughing and praying a rather schizophrenic ride. And when it finally, and we went through two full revolutions because the, the track goes through Mickey Mouse's ears. It has two of those ears. So you go in a full revolution twice. About the second revolution, I didn't hear her for a minute. I said, well, did she faint back there? But by the time we got to the end and we got off that ride, she vowed, she said, I will never get on a ride again. I said, but you did it. She said, but I'll never do it again. And she's kept her vow to the Lord. Unlike Samson, she told me, I've never gotten on another ride. But on that ride, as we were going upside down, I was amazed that I wasn't as afraid as I thought I would be. So then we went on the Tower of Terror and it takes you high, 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 and it drops you down. Then it takes you up high again. And then the doors open to this elevator that you're sitting in and you shoot out and the bottom drops out from beneath you. And I did not have an accident. I didn't need Depends undergarments. I survived it. So now I'm feeling myself and I'm saying, you know what, I'm really getting brave. So fast forward and I go to, um, Puerto Vallarta with my god sister and we decide we're going to go parasailing and so we go and we sign up for the parasailing and we decide we want to go in tandem because we're kind of afraid to go high up in the air and so when we we go to the place to sign up they ask us well do you want to go together we said yeah we want to go in tandem well they weighed us and they told us that together we exceeded the weight limit <laughs> to go together <laughs> so we had to go alone and I realized that sometimes when God is trying to take you higher or take you to certain heights, you have to go alone because otherwise it'll be too heavy. He wants you to go alone. So we got on this parasail by ourselves. And I want to start sharing my screen now because I want to show you what I'm talking about. Let's see if I can do this here. We need to put our seat belts on. Sounds like put it. Put seatbelts <laughs> on. Because we're talking about no fear of falling. And what you see on the screen is my second flying event. The first event, let's see if it cooperates. That is Linda in the sky over Puerto Vallarta. And when I got on this parasail, they start reeling you out on a tether higher and higher until finally the boat was almost mic microscopic. But I was in the air and while up there, I started to realize that the things that I normally had to look up to see were now underneath me. I saw birds flying underneath my feet and I was looking down at the water and I was high. And God wants you to fly higher than your fear. He wants you to rise above it. And so then the next time we decided that we were going to fly um, we were in Interlaken, Switzerland, but I want to tell you about the time in between there. Um, let me see if I can find it. Okay, so here we're... Here it is. My daughter, knowing that I'm a, a daredevil um, and having been bitten by the um, daredevil bug herself, she decided that for my birthday when I was about 54 or 53 that she was going to give me paragliding, I mean, skydiving as a birthday gift. And we were going to go in tandem, but when we got there, there were some glitches with the planes. And so I wound up having to get on a plane without she and uh, one of her best friends, Raquel Lassonier, who had decided to go with us. She was one of my RAs. And when we got there, we signed up and you had to sign a waiver that if anything happens, they're not responsible. That should have given us pause, but no. Then in addition to that, we paid an extra amount of money so that we could go 
a few thousand feet higher as if jumping from a plane at 10,000 feet was not high enough. So we get on the plane and as I said, God sometimes uses unconventional ways to teach me lessons and to uplift and encourage me. So we get to the area where we're boarding the plane and I'm talking to this individual who you see on the screen, he's called your pilot. And so he jumps with you. And so we get to the plane and we get on and there are no seats on this plane. You just climb in and you sit on the floor of this plane, this propeller plane. And I was in the plane with a few other people who were crazy too, and they were jumping. But when I got on, he started talking to me and some of the things that he said to me, he revealed that he was agnostic. And so um, he said to me, um, we're gonna go higher. So the other people were out of the plane by now. They had jumped and I didn't even see when they jumped from the plane because to tell you the truth, I had my eyes closed and I was praying. But then this man who was a self-proclaimed agnostic said to me, do you, are you afraid? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, a little bit of fear is a healthy thing. And then he said to me, well, do you want to pray? And I thought to myself, this agnostic wants to pray. I said, okay, sure. And so he said, all right, repeat after me. And he said, dear God, I said, dear God, he said, please help. I said, please help. And he said, Edwin, not to mess up today. Whereupon I opened my eyes and realized not only am I jumping from the plane with an agnostic, I'm jumping with an insane person. I really must be crazy. But just before we exited the plane, he said to me, I want to give you some instructions and I want you to follow these instructions and keep this in mind. He said, I'm going to open the door. But before I open the door, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to get on your knees. He said, before we approach this situation where you're going to, I'm going to open this door and you're going to see down and you're going to be afraid, I want you to get on your knees. He said, and then I want you, you're going to be kneeling in front of me and I want you to lean back on me because I have experience and I know what's about to happen and I've been through this many times. They've got to jump 200 times before they can actually skydive and be an instructor. They've got to jump 200 times. So then he said, and then I'm going to connect you to me. We have a harness and I'm going to clip you onto me. I'm going to connect you to me. And as long as you stay connected to me and you lean on me, you'll be safe. And this agnostic did not realize he's preaching me a sermon by now. So he, oh, so I, I get on my knees. I lean on him. I connect myself to him. And then I lean on him. And then we scoot to the edge of the plane and he reaches around and he opens the door and I swing my feet out. And that was the first thing that you saw. And he said, now, the last thing I want you to know is that when you are falling, because we're not going to jump from the plane, we're going to fall out of the plane. When you are falling, look up. When you are falling, look up. And when we fell from the plane, I looked up and all I saw was blue skies. I saw the beauty of what God has created. And I had no fear. And we did a, a 30 second free fall, as you see that I got that free facelift. And the wind was pushing my face back, but I had no fear because I was connected to someone who knew what he was doing. I had looked up when I was falling, so I never saw down. I only saw up. And then I felt the freedom of the wind. And by the time we had done the free fall and he pulled the parachute and it buoyed us up, he said, now that I have held the controls, I'm gonna give the controls to you. He said, and I want you to hold these controls. When you pull one cord right, it's gonna make us go right. When you pull the left cord, we're gonna go left. And then he said, now pull the right cord and just hold it down. And we were spinning around in the air, free. And it was so beautiful an experience that when it was time to come down, I didn't even want to come down from this height. And as we landed, he said, when we land, he said, I want you to just put your feet out and we're going to just slide right to a stop. It was one of the most beautiful experiences of my life. And I learned from it that when you are approaching something frightening or you are afraid you're going to fall, you look up. Then I wanna share with you my next experience in Interlaken, Switzerland. The next time I decided to go flying, we were paragliding over the Swiss Alps and I wanna share this with you. Okay, so here we're about to go paragliding. Here we go. Are we crazy? Probably. <laughs> but I think it's going to be fun. Here we go. 
So what you see is the Swiss Alp, uh, the Swiss Alps in Interlaken, Switzerland. We went up to a cliff. We drove for about 45 minutes up around a winding um, with switchbacks, winding road with switchbacks all the way to the top of this mountain. When we got to the top, um, and many of you may not know this, but in, in Switzerland, um, the prevailing religion is, is um, atheism for many. And when I got to the top, I was assigned my pilot and this pilot was an atheist, this person that was gonna jump with me. He said, do you believe in God? I said, yes, I do. And he said, okay. We get to the cliffs and Brooke goes to one cliff, the young lady Raquel, who you just saw in the, in the video clip, who went skydiving with us, went to another cliff. And then I went to one and he said to me in a very thick uh, German accent, he said, when I say run, when I say jog, jog. When I say run, run. And I have on this harness and I realize he says, jog, jog, jog. And I start jogging and I realize I'm jogging toward a cliff. Shouldn't I be going in the opposite direction? And then he says, run. And as fast as I could, I had to run toward the cliff. But before we fell off the cliff, before we jumped off the cliff, the wind took us up. So we never fell. Once we got in the air, we were up there in this beautiful, ter above this beautiful terrain, this landscape of snow-capped mountains in Switzerland. It was absolutely stunning. And I could hear his voice very clearly because you just didn't feel the wind. And I said to him, he said, is it beautiful? And I said, yes. And he said, well, we have the benefit of the wind so we can hang around up here in the sky until your daughter goes from the other cliff. And then you can take selfies her pilot will bring her over to us and we can all take selfies in the sky together. And I said, the wind? I said, I don't even really feel any wind. He said, oh, it's very windy today. I said, but I don't feel it. He said to me, look over there on that peak. Do you see that flag? And there are these flags that they use to gauge the strength of the wind or the speed of the wind. And I said, I see it. He said, do you see how it's straight up? I said, yes. He said, that means it's very windy. I said, but I don't feel it. He said, look down at the lake down there, and I think it was Lake Tombs. And he said, look at the lake. Do you see all the ripples on the water? And I said, yeah, I see the ripples. He said, I said, but I don't feel the wind. He said, that's the wind on the water. He said, sometimes when you don't feel it, you have to look for the evidence of it. Sometimes wow. when you don't feel it, you have to look for the evidence of it. And my mind immediately went to times in my life when I did not feel God's presence. And I felt that I was alone. And I didn't know how God could bring me out here into this wilderness to leave me hanging in the sky. And I heard these words ring so true that sometimes when you don't feel it, you have to look for the evidence of it. And then this man said to me, we're just going to hang around up here. And then finally, Brooke came over and Raquel came over. And with a selfie stick, he took pictures of us with nothing but blue sky. And he said, now, when it's time for us to come down, don't be afraid. When we come down, when we hit the ground, you're never gonna crash into the ground. He said, when we land, I just want you to walk. And we came down and here's what happens. This is Brooke in the sky. She's coming down for this landing. And we had already landed, so then we were able to film her. Look at this. She's on the ground. And she just walked. Sometimes we are so afraid of coming down from where God, from where God takes us. We're afraid that we're going to crash into the ground and we're going to fail. And so there are three types of failure that Satan uses to try to keep us from reaching the heights that God wants to take us to. Fear of failure. Sometimes we don't reach for what we know God has for us because we're afraid we'll miss the mark. God wants us to reach for the sky, regardless of what happens. He wants to take us to heights and he wants to, us to reach higher heights. But if we are so afraid that we're not willing to take that leap of faith, we may miss out on something that God has in store for us that fear kept us from acquiring. 
The second type of fear that the devil uses to try to hold us back and keep us down is fear of loneliness. Sometimes God is trying to prepare this beautiful relationship for us or position for us or this wonderful thing for us, but we're too afraid to let go of what what is holding us back and what God may not necessarily have designed for us because we just don't want to be alone. And so we stay where we, we stay in stuck because he, we don't want to reach the stars. And I remember as a child, I was afraid of the dark. And so I, I, I would, my mother would put me to bed at night and I was so lonely. I was so afraid that I was alone in that room at night. And that's where the fear of abandonment comes in that Satan uses. I felt abandoned. I felt like I was alone and I was afraid that God was not with me in that room as a child. But as I grew older and God allowed me to get over that fear of abandonment, he allowed me to wind up in a position at Oakwood where when the lights go out, they run to me. Students come to me in the dark who are, who are afraid. And I remember about a week or so ago, all of the lights went out in, in a, this large section of Huntsville. And so the dorm was pitch dark. And I remember walking through the halls and my flashlight went out. And I was walking through the halls with a bullhorn telling the girls we were safe. And it gave me an immediate flashback to those nights when I was alone in my bed and afraid, so afraid of the dark that I would cry out to my sisters who were in a bed across the room. And I would beg them if I could come and get in the bed with them. And they said, well, you can get in the bed with us, but you have to get in the crack by the wall. It should be a horror story, the crack by the wall. And I would go and get in that crack by the wall where the, the mattress had kind of separated from the box spring. And so there was a groove and I'd get in that crack by the wall because I was afraid of dark. And now here I am walking through dark places, reassuring others. And then I'm in this residence hall by myself in the summer and people say, aren't you afraid in that residence hall by yourself? And I'm really not. I tell them I'm more afraid when the girls are here. But God had to take me to all, through all of these channels and to all of these places to help me develop the sense of courage and lose my fear of falling. And maybe where you are in your life right now, God wanted you to see these pictures and hear this narrative so that you would know that you don't have to be afraid of heights because God wants to take you to some places that if you're afraid, you're never going to be able to achieve the greatness that he has for you because it's going to take being elevated or taken to a higher level. And there's that song, Lord, lift me up and I shall stand by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane that I have found. And then when he does bring your feet to, to, to ground, stable ground, like when you saw Brooke come down and when I landed, you don't have to be afraid of coming down because God took you up in the same God who took you up will keep you from falling. I want, I want to share some texts with you. I want you to think about Peter when he asked God if he could get out of the boat. And God told him he saw Jesus walking on the water and he and the, Peter and the, the, the disciples were in a boat and it was, there was a storm that started furiously raging and they saw this figure coming toward them and they immediately thought it was a ghost, a duppy. And um, then they realized it was Jesus and Peter was brave enough to get out of that boat get out of his comfort, comfort zone and get on the water, but then he made the mistake of looking down. And when he looked down, he started to sink and Jesus reached out and saved him. But sometimes we're Peter, sometimes we, God is taking us through something beautiful into this height, these heights that we can't even imagine, but we have the nerve to look down. And when we look down, we're afraid of what we see. And so we start to fall and God has to take us and uplift us. So I want to share with you these, these texts because I want them to encourage you. Maybe in your situation right now, in your circumstances, you feel like you're being held back and that you're, you're going through trials and tribulations that are keeping you from, from going any higher. Well, listen to what the word says. Psalm 118 verses 13 and 14. I was pushed hard so that I was falling. But the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. You're going through something right now and it's so heavy and it's so burdensome. You don't think you'll ever rise above it. Second Corinthians chapter four, verses eight through 15. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. We haven't been abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, 
that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Remember, here's another passage that I want to share with you. Psalm 37, 24. Though he fall or though she fall, he or she shall not utterly be cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. God wants us up. I love being up. And one of the reasons why I love being up so much is because when you're high up, all of the cares and all of the problems of life seem very minute, very small. And sometimes God allows, I feel, us to go up high so that we can look down and see how small our problems are so that when we come down and we're in the midst of those problems again, we realize that they aren't as big as we thought they were. God wants you to be able to soar. But if you are afraid of heights, there's no way that you can soar because you're going to be afraid of looking down. Don't look down, look up. This was at the end of our flying experience, my daughter and I. And I think that one of the reasons why God allowed me to go through all of those things is because we all have fears. My daughter um, was fearful of the graduate program she had to do, yet she graduated with honors. Uh, Raquel, who you saw in the videos, was afraid of law school. She's now completed law school. And, and sometimes there are some fears that you have to approach and face head on. My friend Gina fell off of her bike recently and broke her elbow but she's back on that bike, maybe too soon for my liking, but she's back on that bike because she had to embrace that fear or she'd never get on that bike again. My friend Lisa, who I shared with you, was afraid of heights. We went to, um, where did we go? Somewhere beautiful. Um, I can't remember the name of it. Some island, Aruba. And we decided we were gonna go out parasailing because she was fearful. Yes, Lisa, Aruba. She had this fear of heights and she had told the Lord, I'm never gonna get on another roller coaster ride. But she said, I wanna approach my fear of heights. And that girl went up paragliding. And yeah, I heard her screaming and praying in the air from the boat, but maybe sometimes God has to take us up high enough to make us pray, who knows? But I say all of this to say, and I've shared all of these stories because sometimes God wants to repurpose your fear and use it to build your faith. So today, what are you afraid of? I'm not encouraging you to be a daredevil like me. I'm not encouraging you to, be, to do anything dangerous, but what I am challenging you to do is to face that thing that you may be afraid of and allow God to bring you through it so that he can show you, he can show you that you're bigger than your fear. Your faith will surpass your fear if you allow it to. And if God is going to take you to the places higher and higher and higher that he wants to take you, you got to get over the fear of whatever it is that's been holding you back. Maybe you want to get another degree. Approach it. Approach that fear. Do it. Maybe, you know, I realize now that the reason why God had to let me do some things not in tandem, like he separated me from Brooke when I had to go up in that plane by myself and he separated me from my God sister Christina when we went parasailing because God knew I was coming to a time in my life where I'd be by myself. And I've had to learn to do some things on my own during this period of my life that if I was tethered to somebody else or if I was afraid of being alone, I would never be able to achieve where God wants to take you, be willing to go, Ask him to make you brave. Ask him to give you courage. Ask him to help you to shake loose the fetters of fear. And then you will be amazed at where he takes you, how high he takes you. And then guess what? Others are going to get a chance to look up there and say, is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, that's Linda. No, that's Miriam. No, that's Debbie. No, that's Gina. That's Lisa up there. That's been no, that's Helen. Soaring, flying high. That's Leah. That's Pam. That's Margaret, that's Esther, that's Patrick. When people look up, they're gonna know that God took you up. And if God takes you up, you don't have to be afraid of falling because whom the Lord takes up, he is not gonna let you fall. He will keep you from falling. And if you do happen to slip a little bit, the good thing is, though you may fall, you will not be utterly cast down. Be encouraged. Thank you so much, Linda, for that wonderful presentation.
Praise the um, Lord. That was just so powerful. And the, the pictures, I didn't know you were such a thrill seeker. I am a thrill seeker. I, I thought I was a little, you know, I thought I was doing pretty good. But Linda, you, you I think you have definitely taken the cake with this one. I, I too like to go on rides at, at theme parks, and but I don't like the ones that drop suddenly. But I have never thought about uh, you know, some of the things that you shared on any of these rides. Now, maybe in the garden, when I'm gardening, God speaks <laughs> to me through gardening, yes. but, but never on a ride. And, well, you know, um, it's weird. God works with me in strange ways. You know, he, has to, <laughs> he knows that I failed pre-cal twice, so he's got to give me simple lessons. <laughs> I mean, it just goes to show that God speaks to each of us through different, different ways, you know, in different ways. And, and, um, and you said something that, you know, that made me think about fear. When you, you talk about fear, I, I have seen through, throughout my professional career where sometimes people, because they are fearful of things, they self-sabotage, mm -hmm. you know? Um, mm -hmm. It could be, for example, you know, I've worked in residential, uh, you know, treatment facilities for, for young people. And just as that young person was getting ready to leave, they would do something. They'd relax. To, to yeah. basically get held back, you know, or a, a, and or a student that's getting ready to graduate, you know, because they were fearful of basically having to go out into the real world and, and maybe go back to home, back home to certain issues or problems that were there. In the class they fail a class when they could have easily passed that class. And so um, in, in your experience, uh, tell us about how we sometimes uh, sab we self-sabotage well, we because do. of and fear. We do. And um, there's something called a self-fulfilling prophecy. And sometimes we make things happen uh, because we feared them. Um, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to give it to you in a broader sense as well. And, and this is really with relationships. This is with, jobs this is in a lot of ways a lot of times you know prisoners when they're about to get out of prison or when they get out of prison they real they feel like the world is too big and they'll do something to wind up back in prison god wants to set us free from things um he set me free from my fear because he knew that if i was afraid um of going higher there might become a there might be a time in my life when i wouldn't be able to achieve something because i felt like it was too big for me and god has been very very kind and um, gracious toward me. And I've had a lot of wonderful experiences. I've met some really wonderful people. Um, God has surrounded me with love, the love of, of friends who've encouraged me and uh, helped to propel me forward and told me, girl, you can do it. You can do it. Um, because a lot of times fear, I think, is at the root of even every sin. We, we, sometimes we commit adultery because we're afraid of being alone. We steal because we're afraid of going without. We lie because we're afraid of the truth coming out. We fear makes us very vulnerable. And if we can overcome fear, we could then overcome some of our bigger weightier issues if we could overcome fear. And I've seen students who, um, whose parents brought them here and had these very high hopes for them and expectations. And the moment the students got here, yes, ma'am, yes, Drea. The minute the student got here, for fear that they weren't gonna fit in with the certain group or for fear that this guy wasn't gonna like them. They've done some foolish things to try to be accepted. And the self-fulfilling prophecy of failure came to fruition and they wound up having to go home or something happened that destroyed the trajectory that God had them on. Uh, mm -hmm. And so if we can face fear and overcome it in our lives, then Satan doesn't have that hold on us Fear is, is a, it, it's, it's, it's like a yoke. It's like reins that Satan is holding to control you, whether you go left or right. When you are allowing Satan to use fear, he's got you bridled. But if you will shake free from fear, you'll be unbridled. And then you can, you can do all of the things that God had for you. I remember being afraid of, of getting a divorce because I was afraid that, you know, everybody would say, oh, she failed. I was afraid, you know, she didn't even stay. And I stayed in a bad marriage for seven years because I was afraid that, you know, people were going to be upset with me um, who had been in my wedding and spent money to be in my wedding. And a lot of fears kept me in that situation until finally I was afraid of what my mother would think until finally 
I told my mother the truth about things that were happening. And my mother was like, get out, like the movie, way ahead of its time, get out, get out. And I realized once I got out of that bad situation that the things that I was afraid of didn't even really factor in because I knew God had something better for me called peace mm -hmm. that I was able to experience and realize once I was able to get out. Um, I, as I mentioned in our previous um, meeting, I talked about you know the fear of loneliness and being a single parent and can I do this? But once I started the process, I realized, oh my goodness, there's, the sky is the limit. There's nowhere but up. I felt like a special blend. There's nowhere to go but up and up with Jesus. And I say that with all of my heart because you might be on the verge of something great. Once the door opens to that plane and you see where, where you could fall, it's frightening. But if you dare to look up, like that pilot, told, he said, look up. And when you look up, all you see is blue skies and what God has way up there in, in, in celestial places for you. If you can abandon the fear. I've seen students make mistakes because of fear that this guy wouldn't like them anymore when they should have been afraid he would. And now there is a certain amount of healthy fear that will keep you from stepping out into traffic. I, I wish I could be afraid of my refrigerator my refrigerator door and, and afraid of what would happen if I opened it. I wish I was afraid to click and add to cart on Amazon, but you know, there are some good fears, but when it comes to you being held back from God's purpose for you, you got to abandon that fear. There's no fear of falling. If you trust the one who's going to keep you lifted up. Um, there's a comment in here from Drea. It says fear equals false expectations appearing real. real right that's it. um it's false is it, yeah but they, but they most yeah. of what you're afraid of isn't uh, what most of what you're afraid of happening isn't going to happen a eh? right and then if it does happen it's not going to be as bad as what you thought mm -hmm. but so Satan uses me, that fear well that, that leads me to my next question you went you did a lot of these activities with your daughter so my next question is, can fear or is fear learned? Is it something that many of us learn as children? And then how do we, you know, unlearn it? And, and I'm thinking with you doing what you did with your daughter, you were modeling to her how to overcome fears, how to be brave and so on. But how do we sometimes, those of us that are parents or we have an impact in some child's life, can, can, can we end up teaching people, our children, how to be fearful. You know, it's interesting that you would say that. When I was a child, I was so afraid of the dark and um, my mother and father would send me to bed and they thought that just forcing me to be in that dark room, I'd overcome it. But I was so afraid of what was in the closet. I was afraid of the tree branch in front of the window. I was afraid of what was under the bed um, that was gonna come out and get me. And so I decided um, something must have happened that made me so afraid. And so I'd beg and they'd, sometimes they'd let me keep the light on, but I grew up in a black house and my mother was like, look, we ain't paying this, you ain't paying the light bill. You better get over, ain't no ghost. What you need to be afraid of is the lights being turned off permanently. So um, when I started raising my own child, I kept the lights off and I would, um, I never did anything that would make her fearful. In fact, probably to a fault because I remember when she was a very, very small child, she must not have even been two. Um, and she, she was in the room with me cause she had a little, um, a little tiny bed by mine. And I remember I was on the phone, uh, with one of my girlfriends and I looked around and Brooke was gone and I was like, where is Brooke? And I got up and I just had a little small lamp on in the room and I looked around, she's gone. So I went out into the hallway and I looked and there I saw this little tiny shadowy figure coming up the stairs in the dark, no lights on. And I, I saw this little shadowy figure and it was Brooke. She had gone downstairs in the pitch dark house to get this doll that she had left in the living room in the total darkness. She went downstairs, she got that doll and she was coming back with no lights on. And something in me said, thank God she doesn't have that fear that I grew up with. And I think that sometimes as parents, we can make our children afraid. Like if I said, Brookie, you're in the dark. Oh my goodness, and flipped on the light. She probably would have uh, adapted that same fear of the dark that I'd had, but I made no bones about it. I didn't call any attention to it. 
And so all her life, I've tried to instill in her bravery through showing her things that you don't have to be afraid of. Now she's jumping out of planes. Now she's taking helicopter rides. Now she's para, paragliding and parasailing because she realizes that you don't have to be afraid. And I think that in a lot of ways, we can teach our children to reach for more and achieve more if we don't attach to them the fears we've had. And, you know, I see my girlfriends who have children and they've taught their children to go out and achieve and, uh, and acquire because they instilled in them that fearlessness that's required to be able to become a lawyer or to be able to um, go to college without your, um, without your family, go far away and, um, and attempt to um, learn things and have experiences that maybe our parents didn't have or that we didn't have because we've instilled in them the bravery and the courage to be able to reach for things. And I think that that is something that we have to do as parents. We, ha we do teach fear, but we can also teach courage. We can teach bravery and we can teach fearlessness, but we have to ourselves adopt those feelings so that we can then teach them. You know, that, that, is, that is so true. You know, as a parent myself, I, I have to monitor that I don't project or, you know, put my fears off onto my children so that sometimes they may say oh, I'm going to do such and such like if they say they're going swimming I'm like oh okay like I like swimming but and I love the feel a little concerned but, for them right but I'm not I'm only going to go out so far and 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 even from a cultural perspective you know how it is like oh you go to the beach oh there's okay, sharks boy. there's this there's that there's this. <laughs> Yeah. You know, we can't get our hair wet. We can't go to the beach. Oh, we can't get our hair wet. Way. Yeah, that's the fear of getting your hair wet. <laughs> right. Uh, so I'm not right, Lisa. Right. I have to. Yeah. 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 Like when I, I came to spiders, I'm going to be right. honest. I was afraid of those big. They call them water bugs and palmetto, but it's a roach. <laughs> They're really big and they fly, have the nerve to fly. They have the nerve to fly. So when I first came here, I wasn't ready for these big, horrible roaches. And mm -hmm. I remember I, I, I said, and then anytime I would see one, like one time I remember being in the residence hall and I saw one coming down the hall, just like, like driving down the hall. And it's like, he got to the corner and he turned into a transformer and turned into a truck and turned the corner. It was that big. And I would scream for people to come and kill them until one summer I was here by myself. And the only one that was gonna be able to kill these things was me. And for the person who is a nature lover and um, humanitarian and feels bad, yes, I stomped the life out of the roach because it was the roach or me. And I remember one time I was sitting in my living room one fell from the ceiling because they come in where it's cool in the, in the, in the summer. And they're not, around because it's nasty. They just come inside and they're huge. And I remember one dropped on my arm and I had to track it down. I had to find it because I was alone. Yeah. So I had to overcome that fear. And Lisa calls us to kill spiders, but there, there has come a time in her life where she's had to kill a spider. And now she, she gets spray and she'll spray it. But you have to sometimes realize that you have to learn to overcome some things on your own because you're not always gonna have somebody there with you. Um, there may come a time when you have to go it alone and you have to learn to overcome on your own because mm -hmm. your children grow up and they move away. Um, relationships change and there may be times in your life. And so if one of your fears is the fear of loneliness, you need to start spending some time with God and asking him to give you the courage to be by yourself long enough just to hear him and, and learn that if it's just you and him, mm -hmm. You're not alone. I, I was, and as you know, I'm thinking about all the various stories in the Bible where people were fearful. You know, mm -hmm. Moses didn't want and the outcome. You know, you know, yeah. Initially, he was like, I, I can't speak eloquently, mm -hmm. and you know, yeah, he was afraid to help help God deliver his people. He was afraid. Right. Of it. Yeah. And um, yeah. I guess the, the is there anything, if you don't mind sharing with us, that you did not accomplish in life because of fear and as you look back yeah you know you yeah. think oh, yes. yourself, if, oh, I, yeah. if I was the person I am now today this is what I would have been doing is there anything yeah. that you well I share? mean I, I I for the longest I grew up um I had some um learning challenges and now as an adult I realized I was dyslexic and um so I I couldn't read 
when I was a little girl, I could not read. And I remember being in the reading circle uh, at Plainfield Grammar School and the teacher who I had, and teachers can do a lot of damage or they can build beautiful character and help children develop. Teachers have a huge responsibility. And so I hope that the teachers, um, teachers have to recognize that responsibility because you can, you can help or you can hinder. And I remember the teacher I had hindered me. And so we were in the reading circle and I could not read. And so I would count, we'd have to read, Jack played with Spot, Spot ran. And each of them, the little book would have sentences and each person in the reading circle had to read a sentence when it was their turn. So I would count the number of people that before it came to me and then I'd count the sentences and I'd realize, okay, this is the sentence I'm gonna have to read. So I'd sit there while everybody else was reading. I was studying that sentence, trying to figure it out. What does it say? And trying to read it. And then I'd memorize it. And then when it came to me, I would look at it and I would read it from memory. I couldn't read, but I, I would recite it from memory. And the teacher figured out that I was doing it. And so then she would cover my page. And when it was time for me to read mine, I would stumble and fumble and she would take a pencil and hit me on my hands, beat me on the back of my hands with a pencil. So I de developed this fear of reading. I never wanted to read publicly. Uh -huh. And so, but praise God. And I never got tested or anything because back then, you know, parents weren't as educated and had not evolved to the place where we are. You know, I took my child when we did, 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 uh, found out that she was, did, I took her and had her tested and found that she's got this beautiful, brilliant mind. And she's written a couple of books now, by the way, she's got some children's books that are going to be um, published, but I didn't have that opportunity. So I just felt dumb. I remember my parents bringing a desk home in the trunk of the car from, from the school, grammar school. And I had to read all summer and do lessons while all of my little friends were playing outside the window. I was sitting, so I didn't want to read. So eventually I realized, you know what? You got to get over this thing. So I started writing poetry and then I started writing short stories. And then I ultimately wound up as a dyslexic person, wound up as a newscaster reading copy for a living. And it was because I was able to approach that. But I think that had I had that fear not held me back, I might have achieved some things earlier in life and I might have entered into that career path earlier. And I think it may have stopped me from one day being a television anchor, which is what I wanted to do. Um, because I did not start early enough because of my fear. So that held me back. But God had me for such a time as this. So I can't mourn the loss of what wasn't because I have to celebrate the, the reality of what is. Uh, and God, I feel, brought me to the place where I am now for the purpose that I'm serving now. But I think that fear does hold you back from some of the things that you could probably achieve if you weren't afraid. And right now I've got this fear of, of going back to school that I have to overcome because I want to get an advanced degree. So now I have to work on it. I've got to approach that. And I think now is the perfect time in life to do it. Yeah, most definitely. And of course we fear age. Yeah. Uh, fear getting yeah. older. We That's fear that. Thing. As long as there's black hair dye, <laughs> bring it on. As long as there's, as long as there's this cream that I can rub on my right hip when it's exactly. burning at night, bring it on. <laughs> have Geritol will travel. It's all good. <laughs> I, have a, I have a good question here. It says, um, apart from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, are there are there any resources or books, Linda, that you would recommend to help with the process of overcoming fear? Oh, I did read this one book that was awesome. Um, and I read it some years ago and there are several books um, on leadership, but I, I, I read this one book by Brennan Manning some years ago and it's called The Wisdom of Tenderness. And I think that one of the ways that we can start to overcome fear is to love ourselves and recognize that God really loves us because a lot of times I think we fear, we fear because we don't honestly believe that God's got us. And we don't want to admit that, but sometimes we really don't believe that God truly has us in mind. And in this book that I read, I learned that um, God not only loves us, but he likes us. You know, God is love. It's no leap of the imagination or no stretch of the imagination to believe that God loves us because God is love. That's his very nature. Of course he loves us, but to believe that he likes us is something different because we may have family members that we have to love, but we truly do not like them. 
you know, but for God to like me means he gave us flowers, but he made them special colors because he likes us and he wanted to see that we enjoy these things. Um, he loves us, so he gave us children, but then he likes us, so he made our children have a sense of humor that would make us laugh. Mm -hmm. And if we can truly believe that God loves us and likes us, he likes us enough to be around us. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm going to be there with you always. And so knowing that, knowing that I'm loved and liked by God helps me overcome the fear of doing things that I know God is with me while I'm attempting to achieve. So that's one book that I read that I would recommend. Um, and you know what I'll do? I'll, I'll, I'll share them via email and then maybe you can send them out to this group or, yeah. or wherever you post it, you can share them. But you know, I, I love, um, I'm gonna be very honest here. I love the messages that God has given me. I, one of my favorite books is one I wrote. And, and the reason why is because it was my experiences that showed me that God had not forsaken me, that God was with me. When I wrote those books, Fragments 1 and 2, they were written, one of them was written while my sister was dying of cancer. And I was in, in complete panic. I was totally falling apart. And I was far away. I was in Seattle and she was in Huntsville and I maxed out every credit card flying back and forth trying to get here and I feared death. Most of my life I've had a fear of death. And so I've lost a lot of siblings and loved ones so that God could show me that you will survive this and you'll grow from it. And death is not the end. There's something worse than death and it's losing salvation. Mm -hmm. And so while it's been very painful, I've learned a lot through loss and the fear of loss. Um, I've had to get over it. Um, because I, <laughs> I wasn't going to move forward without getting over it. And when I lost my sister, Sylvia, she was my, my closest. And, you know, families, you know, we always have a favorite person for this and a favorite person for that. And we have different relationships with my sister, Mary, and it. Um, we are so close. My brother, Michael, and I were close. My brother, Gil, there are only five of us left. Five are gone. But Sylvia, I slept in a bed with her as a child. So we developed the closeness just because we slept in the bed together. And so when she was dying, I remember trying to get here one day and I was so afraid she would die before I got here. And a friend of mine from my, my job in Seattle, Tammy, she gave me air miles to fly here because um, we had gotten the word that my sister probably wasn't gonna make it. Uh, through the weekend. So I was going to try to come on, on, go on Friday, but she said, no, you need to go now. So she gave me miles and I was flying and I kept getting bumped off flights because I was flying on miles and I was in an utter panic that I wasn't going to make it. And I remember calling my friend Lisa and telling her, I'm not going to make it. Not. And I remember calling all my friends. And at one point I had flown, I think to Phoenix and from Phoenix, I got bumped and I flew to Atlanta and then I was bumped and I'm sitting in some airport somewhere and I'm on the phone crying, maybe to, I might've been crying to Lisa or my friend Sue or somebody. And after I hung up the phone, there was a lady sitting next to me. I'm fearing death and I'm fearing she's not gonna make it. And the lady says to me, I didn't mean to eavesdrop, but I heard you on the phone talking about what's happening with your sister. And um, I'm on this next flight, I have a guaranteed seat. So I wanna give you my seat so that you can make it. I said, well, I don't know that you can do that. I don't know that you can give me a seat. She said, well, we won't know if we don't ask. So let's go to the, come on, let's go to the ticket counter. So we go to the ticket counter and um, there's a red uh, coat standing there, the man in the red coat who can do stuff. And he, and she said, I want this person to get on this next flight. Tell him your story, tell him why. And I explained that my sister was dying. She was in, in intensive care and we were afraid she wasn't gonna make it. And I'd been bumped and I'd been flying for 17 hours by now. And um, the gentleman said, hold on a second. He clicked on the computer and then he handed her a boarding pass and he handed me a boarding pass. And he said to me, um, you're on the next flight. So I sat down in the gate area and she said, I'm going to get a drink. And I was like, I didn't know angels drank, but okay. Yeah. Um, so she said, I'm going to get a drink because this thing stressed me out. So she came back. When we get on the plane, we're boarding. I look at my ticket. I'm in first class. And she walks past me to coach. And then she walked up during the flight and she said, do you know how to get to the hospital from Huntsville? I said, it's been a lot of years. She said, when we get there, when the plane lands, when you get your rent a car, I'm going to get my car and I'll lead you there. So she leads me to the hospital. I pull out. She leads me to the hospital. I jump out of my rent a car to go hug her. She said, don't waste no time hugging me. Get in that hospital. And 
my friend Vicky just happened to be there in the parking lot. It's 11 o'clock at night. And she flags me down and she says, come, come get in my car for a minute. And I said, I got to get inside. She said, no, I want you to eat this baked potato and this salad from Wendy's. And I said, I'm not, she said, I need you to eat this. And that was because she had been at the hospital earlier with my sister, she and her mother and father, and they had seen my sister. And they knew that once I saw her, she knew once I saw her, I wasn't going to be able to eat. So I go into the hospital. She prays with me. I go into the hospital. I go to the room where my sister, where her name is. I, I, I First I asked, I said, is Sylvia Wilson here? And they said, she's in the cubicle at the end. So I go down and I see her name. I open the curtain and I didn't recognize her. God is getting me over this fear of death and I don't even know it. I look at her and I said, oh, that can't be my sister. And I went back and I said, but it says her name. And then I walked over to her, the bed and she had a scar on her face from where when she was a teenager, a girl at our church had slashed her face over some dude. So she had had this scar on her face her whole life. And by her scar, I knew her. By her scar, by her scar, I knew her. By our scars, people are gonna know who we are by our scars. And I looked at her and I kissed her on her lips and she woke up and she said, who is this kissing me? And I said, it's me. And she said, are you insane that you've come all this way? And I said, you're just so popular. And she talked to me and she said, they said, I ain't got long. And over the next, the Lord let her live for two months so that we could all fly there. All of us saw her, all of us saw her. We all went to visit her and she imparted, she, my brother Gilbert said at her funeral, Sylvia, many people will teach you how to live. Sylvia taught us how to die. She died with such dignity. And no, I don't want to see anybody die. I don't want to die. I don't want my friends to die, but God showed me that we are survivors and more than that we thrive if we can make it through a harsh trial and if we're not afraid of what's on the other side god will get us through these things loss death hardship pain suffering if we don't fear it because we know god is with us and my hope now is for the resurrection when are we going to fly again? You better get over that fear now because we're going to fly. And yes, we are more than conquerors. Mm -hmm. And death is not the end. It's but a sleep. And when that girl wakes up, that scar will be gone and she will fly and she will soar. And so those of you who are fearing the inevitable, something that's coming down the pike, you see it coming and you're so afraid. Stop and enjoy the moments that you have now. Embrace them. Don't allow fear to make you miss out on what you can enjoy right now. And then when you got, if God brings you to it, hi, sweetheart, I'm good, sweet girl. Happy Sabbath to you too. My girl's walking by. <laughs> God, if he's gonna bring you to this place, he's gonna bring you through this place. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will what? Fear no evil, for thou art with me. Amen. And, and Linda, you know, the other thing that came to mind as you talked was that sharing our fears with others so that we can get support and that yes. people can pray for us. You know, yes. you talked about many of your friends that were there for you as you were going through, you know, a hard time. Um, and many of them are here on, in this room right now. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as you said, it's important that we, we have a support group Yes. Um, we pray, uh, we read books. Um, Spencer Johnson, um, Who Moved My Cheese? That's a really good book about fear and dealing with change and the fear of change. Yes, and, yes. And, and, yes, and, you know, not getting stuck in a place where you can't move forward. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, yeah, seeking, seeking. Because fear will um, paralyze you. Exactly. Fear will paralyze you. And you sometimes right. you need those friends that say, come on, get up. Come on, girl. Right. Um, I remember I, my hair fell out. Uh, because I was so traumatized by my, my, um, my sister's slow death. And then five months later, my brother died suddenly. And I went and I had to have my head shaved. And I remember my friend, Vinette telling me, girl, I'll glue some on for you. It's all good. <laughs> but I got brave enough to where I just wore the bald head. I shaved my head. I took my hair to my sister's grave and I put it down. And it was a funny story later. My brother-in-law said he went to my sister's grave one day and he saw hair on the grave and he was afraid. He said, did somebody try to do something or, and finally one day I told him, I said, yeah, when I went to Syl's grave, the hair that they had shaved off, I, I brought it and I put it down on her grave and he was like, oh, he thought somebody was trying to do voodoo or something. <laughs> and it was my hair that I decided to give to her. 
but yeah, we have to, we have to lean on our network. I have a crew. Uh, we, we text each other daily and we encourage each other. I, I've got friends who stop by this residence hall and encourage me. I have a friend who just came and brought me Lysol liquid gold. Thank you, Vicki. <laughs> so, you know, you have to have a support network and they're like your safety net so that as you're on the flying trapeze, because you're a daredevil, if you happen to slip, you fall in a net of love and it gives you the courage to climb back up there and try it again. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Linda, for sharing with us today. It, it, this was such a good discussion because- I hope so. You I know, hope there, received something. There's so much happening right now. We're moving into an unknown phase right now, especially mm -hmm. here in the United States with elections. Pandemic. And, and the pandemic, um, you know, the fear of the future. Um, so with that in mind, just if you could just share a closing, just a few lines about as we look to the future, how can we um, not be fearful or how can we manage the fear that we may yeah. be feeling? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's real. You know, COVID-19 has, it brings out the best and the worst of us. I remember crying a couple of weeks ago because I was afraid I was going to have to fly and I don't want to fly right now. And the reason why is because I've lost so many siblings and my siblings were afraid for me to get on a plane. And when I found out I couldn't even go to Connecticut because I was coming from a, a hot spot that I wasn't even going to be allowed to go home. And I just was heartbroken, bereft that I could not go and visit my family. And that's what a lot of us are experiencing. We can't fly places. We can't spend time with our loved ones. And Satan is using COVID-19 to put masks on us so that we can't even see each other's faces and smiles. Um, we have to stay six feet apart. So there's that social distancing that's keeping us apart. You know, Satan is involved in all of this. But one thing that I'm learning um, through this pandemic and, you know, being afraid of COVID-19, I've had five COVID tests. They've all been negative, praise God. But I live in a residence hall with a lot of students and, you know, we're trying our best to make sure they stay healthy. We walk into the lobby and there's a, a, a standalone thermometer that takes our temperature. Um, it's a new day. It's a new era. There's a lot of uncertainty. But in the midst of all of this, we have to cling to the things that we know are certain. God's love, hopefully your faith, the love of family and friends. The temptation would be to just focus on the fear, the fear factor and all of the things that could happen and that, uh, all of the hardships that we're facing. But we have to condition ourselves to look for the good and recognize that the same God who has brought us here is the same God who will take us through. You're here because God has kept you till now. He's got angels that are encamped around you. And if you will hold on to Psalm 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. If you will hang around right there, as that, that pilot told me, let's hang around in the air for a while, let's because we've got the benefit of the wind. Hang around that, that thought right there dwelling in the secret place of the most high. You'll abide under the shadow of the almighty and he will keep you. He, he, he said that a thousand might fall at your right hand and, and, and even more, but no harm will come nigh your dwelling. Trust God, believe those things. In a time when everything is uncertain, hang on to the certain things. The word is true. God's word is truth. And he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And some of you might be saying, but God said, lo, I'm with you always. Why are you going up in the air? It's because lo, right here, right now, God said, I'll be with you always. It's a different lo. It's not L-O-W. It's L-O. Lo, God is with you. And he has promised to never leave you nor forsake you. And if you hold on to that, and if you believe that, then you will be able to endure this big trial, this new normal that we've never experienced before, even though there's nothing new under the sun. God, this is nothing new to God. If you will trust in him and in his power, you do not have to fear the unknown because there's nothing that's unknown to God. Nothing. Trust God. We're going to get through this. And life may never be what it was, but he's coming soon. And when God comes, all this is going to be obliterated anyway. So trust in him only and lean on him. And as we're about to, if you feel like you're gonna fall, 
lean on him, stay connected to him. And if you feel like you're falling, look up. Even in these trying times, and God will sustain you. He will keep you. Amen. Linda, uh, last time you closed us out with a, 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 a verse from um, God will take care of you. Do you mind singing that again? I think it's so appropriate. And then just close us out with a, a word. I wish we could all open our mics for a minute. I know. Can, can we open our mics and sing? Be I don't know if it will work. We could try. <laughs> Maybe we can try it. <laughs> Let's try it. It will sound like it will sound like it will God will take care of you. Yes. Be need his wings of love. God will take care of you. Beautiful. The chorus. God, God will take care of you. Yes. Through every way. Yes. Along all, all the way. He God, God will take care. Yes, that's my friends, my trio, my quartet, the choir. <laughs> Love Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> Love you, Vinette. Love you all. Praise God. He's got us. Amen. Amen. Us. And I want to I want to say this. Pray for our teachers who are on the front lines. Pray for our child care workers who are on the front lines, who are dealing with students who are face to face with people. Pray for our nurses. Pray for our physicians. Pray for those who are in high risk situations. Pray for all of the family members who we have with comorbidities. Pray for them. Prayer is a parachute. It lifts us up. Let's keep each other in prayer. Amen. Amen. So um, if we just bow our heads to just close out. Yes. Dear God, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful time that we've had together. Thank you for this time to talk about your the power of your love and that you, you through you, we can conquer all fears. Father, we ask that you will continue to be with Linda as she ministers to those in her life. Father, I pray for each person in this room and for those that are listening, that as we go into this new week, we will fear, have no fear, Father, and that we will lean completely on you. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Helen, I love you. It's always so good to see you. I miss you. I miss you too. <laughs> We'll have Thank to figure out a way to, to see each other soon. Amen. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> Thank Hello you Hello everyone so much. In, in London, England. God bless you. Linda, I'd like to say thank you so much um, for blessing us again um, with your wonderful words of encouragement about um, being fearless and all the analogies that you used about the importance of us being dependent on God. And, you know, I like the story of where, when you're in the sky, the importance of looking up as opposed to looking down, because oftentimes mm -hmm. we tend to look down and we tend to get stuck in our problems yeah. rather than looking at the source. That's so right thank there. you. Um, you always bring an amazing message. Um, so thank you. We're hopeful that, you know, in the future after COVID-19, you can come and spend some time with us. I yes, ma'am, I'm there. Mike Johnson wanted to also get in contact with you because he wanted you on his radio program. I'd love that. Yeah, okay. And thank you, Helen, for hosting. And I'm truly grateful for David Person for um, recommending you. Um, and it wasn't yeah. until you came on. I saw David yesterday. <laughs> so, yeah. 
And um, so thank you. Thank you everyone for um, participating and supporting the programme, both on Zoom and YouTube. Tomorrow we will have Cicely talking about the importance of women having a voice. Um, so women don't be silent. Please join at 6pm. Linda, do you have time because um, for people to speak to you offline? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, so if you wish to um, stay and talk to Linda offline, you're more than welcome to. Um, we will close the YouTube, so it won't be recorded on YouTube, but for those of you who, who are online, thank you once again for supporting Linda, and yeah, have a lovely evening. Thank Until you so tomorrow. much. Okay. God bless you all. And, Cam and Camilla Monk. Oh, oh Carmi. Yeah, she's on next week, Saturday. Awesome, so, I'm so, going to tune in. Yeah. We do radio okay. together here at Oakwood. <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, Have a lovely night, and I can see the net. Um, yeah, there was an Esther that came into the Zoom meeting. I thought it was you. What Zoom meeting? The one I sent to you. <laughs> Tony? Debbie's say? having a side conversation. I, I tried to... <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Well, God bless you all. Thank you. Oh, hi, Latoya. So good to see you. God bless you. <laughs> Love you. Lisa Latoya's here. Yay.